Deeper Timetable of Ideas, Measures, Deductions, and Theories. Copyright 2003 J. Marvin Herndon. W. Gilbert 1600 Lodestone and Magnetic Bodies and on the Great Magnet the Earth, in Latin, London, 1600, Peter Short, 240 p. More than a thousand years ago, the Chinese developed the compass for navigation. The instrument used a lodestone, a natural magnetic stone made of black iron oxide. Sir William Gilbert, the personal physician to Queen Elizabeth I, set out to show that the behavior of the compass was not magic. From experiments, Gilbert showed that the compass points to the north because the whole Earth acts as if it is a giant magnet lodestone. K. F. Gauss 1838 Algemeine Theory des Erdmagnetismus, resulted aus den Biobachtung und des Magnetischen Vereins in Jahr 1838, Leipzig, 73 p. Carl Frederick Gauss, a renowned mathematician, confirmed Gilbert's hypothesis that the Earth acts like a magnet and showed that the magnetic force that attracts the compass needle originates deep inside the Earth, at or near the center of the Earth. H. Cavendish 1798, Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society of London, v. 88. 1798, pages 469 to 474. Henry Cavendish measured the density of the Earth, finding it to be 5.48 times as dense as water. The modern value is 5.5. E. Weekert, 1898, Verhandlung und Gesellschaft Deutscher Naturforscher und TZE, v. 68, 1896, pages 42 to 43. Realizing that Cavendish's measured density of the Earth meant that the Earth as a whole is more dense than rock. Emil Weikert postulated that the Earth has a core similar to iron meteorites as a way to explain the Earth's greater density. Weikert referred to the shell of rock surrounding the core as the mantle, a German word, meaning cloak. Later, the shell of rock surrounding the core became known as the mantle. R. D. Oldham 1906, Court. J. Joel. Sock. Lant, V. 62, 1906, pages 456 When an earthquake occurs, it produces powerful vibrations, waves that are capable of passing through the interior of the Earth. In 132 AD, the Chinese scientist Chang Heng invented the first device, called the Dragon Jar, to detect earthquakes. In 1880, John Milne invented the first modern angelim seismograph. In 1906, Richard Dixon Oldham deduced that the Earth has a core from seismograph tracings which showed that compression earthquake waves passing through the deep interior of the Earth travel at a slower rate than through the more shallow regions. A. Maharovikic 1909, J.B. Met. Obbs. Zagreb, V. 9, 1909, pages 1 to 63. Andraja Maharovikic discovered, from the speed of travel of earthquake waves, the boundary between the crust and the mantle that occurs at a depth of about 35 kilometers 22 miles beneath the continents and a depth of about 10 kilometers 6 miles beneath the sea floor. B. Gutenberg 1913, Physical Zeitschrift, V. 14, 1913, pages 1227 to 1218. Baino Gutenberg made the first accurate determination the radius of the core to be 2,900 kilometers, a value close to the modern value of 3,482 kilometers 2,164 miles. The mantle extends from that radius to a radius of about 6,361 kilometers 39,53 miles and is capped by the crust for an Earth radius of 6,371 kilometers 39,59 miles. B. Gutenberg 1926, Zeitschrift Geophysik, V. 2, 1926, pages 24 to 29. Compression earthquake waves vibrate in the direction of travel. Shear earthquake waves vibrate perpendicular to the direction of travel. Fluids do not support shear waves for the same reason that a liquid cannot be torn. Baino Gutenberg deduced that the Earth's core is fluid due to its failure to support shear earthquake waves. I. in 1936, Publication Bureau Central Seismology International, Series A, V. 14, 1936, Pages 3. Earthquake waves change speed and direction when entering and leaving the Earth's core. Consequently, there is a region, a so-called shadow zone, where earthquake waves should not be detectable, if, as was thought at the time, the Earth consists simply of a mantle and a core. But earthquake waves were in fact detected in the shadow zone. In 1936, Inge Lehman discovered the inner core by correctly deducing that the shadow zone waves were reflections from a small inner core at the center of the Earth within the Earth's fluid core. The radius of the inner core is 1221 kilometers 759 miles. W. M. L. Cicer, 1939, Physical Review, V. 55, 1939, pages 489 to 498. Magnets lose their magnetism when heated. The Earth cannot have a permanent magnet in its core at the temperatures at which the iron alloy main core is molten. There must be some process or mechanism that produces Earth's magnetism. William Elsesser proposed a dynamo theory to explain the Earth's magnetism that was based on the 1919 dynamo theory of J. Larmor to explain magnetic field of the Sun. In dynamo theory, swirling, convecting molten iron combines with the Earth's rotation to generate a magnetic field. The energy source required by the dynamo was assumed by Elsesser to be energy from natural radioactive decay. F. Birch 1940, American Journal of Science, v. 
238, 1940, pages 192 to 211. Francis Birch thought erroneously, because data to the contrary had not yet been discovered that nickel and iron were always alloyed together in meteorites. He also knew that elements heavier than iron and nickel, if combined together, could not make a mass as great as the inner core. He therefore deduced the composition of the inner core as being partially crystallized nickel-iron metal, an intermediate point in the process of the solidification of the Earth's fluid core. W.B. Clark, M.A. Begg, and H. Craig 1969, Earth and Planetary Science Letters, V. 6, 1969, pages 213 to 220. Clark et al. Measured helium coming from deep within the Earth and attributed its origin to a mixture of trapped primordial light helium, 3 He, and heavy helium, 4 He, from the natural radioactive decay of uranium and thorium. For the next three decades, geophysicists were unaware of a process or mechanism deep within the Earth that could produce the light helium, 3 He. J. M. Herndon 1979, Proceedings of the Royal Society of London, Series A, V. 368, 1979, pages 495 to 500. On the basis of data discovered in the 1960s, J. Marvin Herndon deduced the composition of the inner core as being nickel silicide, not partially crystallized nickel iron metal as proposed by Francis Birch in 1940. This means that the deep interior is like an ensotite chondrite meteorite, rather than an ordinary chondrite meteorite as presumed by Birch. The principal implication is that the Earth's core contains radioactive elements, including uranium, which would otherwise not have been expected. J. M. Herndon 1980, Proceedings of the Royal Society of London, Series A, V. 372, 1980, pages 149 to 155. By fundamental ratios of mass, J. Marvin Herndon showed that the core and lower mantle of the Earth are chemically analogous to the two components of the abiensitite chondrite. This provides evidence that the deep interior of the Earth is indeed like an ensotite chondrite meteorite and it means that one can estimate the abundances of the elements in the core and lower mantle from measured abundances in corresponding parts of the abiem meteorite. J. M. Herndon 1993 J. M. Herndon 1994, Journal of Geomagnetism and Geoelectricity, v. 45, 1993, pages 423 to 437. Proceedings of the Royal Society of London, Series A, v. 445, 1994, pages 453 to 461. With knowledge of the ancient remains of natural nuclear reactors discovered in Africa in 1972 and with an understanding that the Earth's core contains uranium, J. Marvin Herndon used Fermi's nuclear reactor theory to demonstrate the feasibility of a natural nuclear fission reactor within the inner core at the center of the Earth. A nuclear reactor is capable of producing much more energy than the radioactive decay of uranium. A natural nuclear reactor at the center of the Earth can provide energy to power the geomagnetic field over geologic time. But unlike other energy sources, which might change only gradually, a deep earth nuclear reactor is capable of variable energy output including stopping because of fission product accumulation and restarting again as the light fission products float radially outward. Variable deep earth energy production may have important, not yet appreciated, implications on planetary change and global warming. J. E. Vidal and H. M. Benz 1993, Nature London, v. 361, 1993, pages 529 to 530. Vidal and Benz deduced islands of matter at the core mantle boundary from seismic data. Although only a minor component within the Earth, these islands are important because they are predicted to be a consequence of the deep interior of the Earth being like an ensotite chondrite meteorite. J. M. Herndon 1993 J. M. Herndon 1996, Journal of Geomagnetism and Geoelectricity, v. 45, 1993, pages 423 to 437. Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences USA, v. 93, 1996, pages 646 to 648. J. Marvin Herndon predicted low density, high temperature earth core precipitates cast and MGS floating atop the fluid core at the core mantle boundary. These are an expected consequence of the ancestite chondrite like core, originally containing some calcium and some magnesium dissolved in the iron alloy. D. F. Hollenbach and J. M. Herndon 2001, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences USA, v. 98, 2001, pages 11,085 to 11,090. Daniel F. Hollenbach and J. Marvin Herndon demonstrated, from numerical simulations made at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, that a deep earth nuclear fission reactor will produce both light helium, 3 He, and heavy helium, 4 He, precisely within the range of values observed from deep source lavas. The helium found in oceanic lavas, first observed over three decades ago, is evidence that a natural, planetary scale, nuclear reactor operates at the center of the earth. J. M. Herndon 2003, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences USA, v. 100, 2003, pages 3047 to 3050. J. Marvin Herndon demonstrated, from more detailed numerical simulations made at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, that a deep earth nuclear fission reactor will produce sufficient helium with precisely the range of ratios as observed from deep source oceanic lavas. 
Moreover, the ratio of 3 He to 4 He increases over the lifetime of the GR reactor. The high ratios observed in Icelandic and Hawaiian basalt suggest that the end of the GR reactor lifetime is approaching, perhaps within the next billion years, and presumably soon thereafter the geomagnetic field will begin its final collapse.